Okay, we're trying to figure out how this, <laughs> we've done through this a couple times, but we're just, be patient with us a little bit. We're trying to do a lot here in a couple different screens. So I'm gonna give a bit of an overview of um, what the association's been doing uh, this through the winter and um, over the last year, really. Uh, I'm gonna start a little bit on sort of state of the industry where we're seeing things are at. And I showed this screen uh, in the fall, but I want to just kind of go over where everything uh, is currently at because numbers have changed slightly since November. Um, Maine actually had a very good year. Uh, they ended up having uh, almost 104 million pounds, um, well above what they were expected going into harvest. Um, as you can see, their five year average is not quite 70 million pounds, so uh, really quite good. Uh, slightly below their high yield of 110 million pounds back in 20, 2000. Uh, New Brunswick had a, a decent crop, 55.8 million pounds um, above their five-year average, but they've had a couple poor crops that have brought their average down uh, below their high yield, of course. Uh, PEI had a decent crop sort of right at their five-year average, certainly below their high crop year of uh, 2016. Quebec uh, obviously had the, a very poor year last year, and they had um, significant frost uh, right near bloom that impacted things significantly, uh, well below their five-year average. And then Nova Scotia, we're right around 49 million pounds this past year. Um, certainly a good crop for us, but not exceptional. Uh, above our five-year average, but of course we've had two or three years where yields were quite poor that's brought that five-year average down. So our total production in the wild blueberry industry uh, was 264 million pounds, slightly above our five-year average, but well below our uh, maximum yield that we had in 216 of 405 million pounds. So that means a couple, there's a couple things to that, of course, that, that means we have, um, you know, our overall supply is down from what our markets can take. So projecting into 2022, what does what do things look like? Um, basically, from what we're hearing from other provinces, it's unlikely to be a bumper crop overall. Um, but again, we're likely looking uh, better than the crop we had in 2021. Uh, Quebec's a bit concerned that they had significant injury on the sprout fields last year due to the sprout. Uh, due to the frost during sprout. So they are projecting a better yield than in 2021, but they're not expecting a massive crop. So the dam, similar to what happened to us in 219, where we had the massive frost in 218, our, our sprout fields didn't, re, didn't uh, produce quite as good as we would hope the following year. And, you know, if you look at in our own province, there's still a significant amount of fescue pressure on fields around the province, which I think is still going to limit yields in some fields. So, you know, I, th I think if we have a good growing season, we're going to have a decent crop, but I think there's still going to be some um, fields that aren't yielding where they need to be. Still a little bit of, a, um, I'll call it a hangover from the three or four previous years of low input, low inputs into some of those fields. So we're going to talk talk a little bit about input costs and supply. Um, as many are aware, that fertilizer costs are certainly going to be going up over the next over this year, related to inflation issues, but also rated, related to world events that are happening. So fertilizer and fuel costs are going to go up significantly, and that's going to impact uh, certainly input costs. And you know there is some concern on you know some pesticides may be limited related to things, uh, you know, supply chain issues, but also there's some um, issues related in uh, other cropping systems that are moving, perhaps moving away from some, some herbicides into others, and it might be impacting the supply of some of our herbicides. So, you know, some crops might not be using as much glyphosate anymore. So will that impact some of the herbicides we use? We'll, we'll wait to see how that happens. So, and in other, not so much in Nova Scotia, but uh, in some of the other jurisdictions, we're, we're 
finding some limited access to pollinators. So related to um, overwintering injury for some of the, the bees. So there's some pro high projected winter losses in central Canada for bees. So that uh, could impact some, some places that are importing bees from that area. So, and then the, of course the other unknowns are, you know, the world events that are happening, uh, inflation and, and COVID could still affect supply chains and input prices. Uh, we've had some meetings with um, other farmers through NSFA and we've, we've seen some changes to uh, consumer habits already. So as uh, consumer prices start to go up in the grocery store, ha purchasing habits are changing. Uh, I think we're a little bit buffered by that in the wild blueberry industry, but we can't ignore that, that, you know, if people, if it's costing more to buy food, perhaps uh, it might impact buying habits around the world for our product. But uh, that being said, uh, with all those risks that are out there, uh, all indications are showing really strong demand for frozen blueberries um, for both wild and high bush. Um, for domestic retail and the overseas ingredient market. So demand appears to be very strong, uh, even with everything that's happening in the world. So that's that's a very positive thing for us at this point. But that's assuming a couple things that, you know, uh, world events and increasing food prices don't have a drastic effect on consumer habits. Um, yeah. So, you know, what happens to things in Ukraine? What, what's that going to impact on the movement of wild blueberries and markets around the world? Uh, the one thing, too, that we're, you know, we're not sure about is, you know, the bilberry harvest in, in Europe. It could be negatively impacted by the events that are happening in, in Ukraine right now. So, you know, the, the good chunk of that industry is based in Poland and in Ukraine. So if that crop can't be harvested, that, that could positively impact our, our uh, demand, unfortunately. Well, fortunately for us, but it's you never like to see those things happen. Um, so there are more markets available than we're, we're currently producing for. That's that's one thing that's clear. So you know we could have sold many more blueberries this past year. Um, so even with an increase in production, prices should should stay healthy this the next couple of years. The outlook looks very positive. That's with a couple of assumptions, assuming world events stabilize and don't escalate, and assuming we don't have successive back-to-back -back bumper crops. So, you know, that in, that's including high bush as well. So, you know, if we have two, two to three years of back-to-back -back bumper crops, then we might run into some issues again. So uh, I just want to review, I've been talking about the Building Tomorrow Fund for the last couple of years, and I just wanted to review that. So the project was completed yesterday, uh, technically. So that was a three year project um, that $930,000. Uh, we did an event two weeks ago on that summarized a lot of the work that was done um, for this project. And those reports are going to be available on our WB PANS website. They're very detailed reports. And we do have a couple fact sheets out on the reception table for for those that are interested. Also on our YouTube channel, we have the presentations posted from the last from two weeks ago. So if you want to go on and look at those, they're there as well. Um, yeah, like I said, they're they're on the uh, YouTube channel. So I want to talk about a few of the promotion activities that we're going to be doing the next uh, few months. So next week, actually, uh, the Saltscapes Expo is going to be live again. So we're uh, the association is going to have a booth there. We're actually partnering with Van Dykes uh, at, at the Saltscapes Expo. Um, it's going to be a little bit different this year. We we typically we hand out samples. We're not doing that this year just because of various issues. Uh, but we are going to be there to tell the wild blueberry story to consumers there um, and talking about our industry talking about the economic benefits of our industry to the Nova Scotia economy. We're also going to be sponsoring the Heartland Tour again this year. So this is a, an event that focuses on cycling activity throughout Nova Scotia. They have multiple events. It's related to cardiovascular health and getting people outside and active. 
So it's a really, we sponsored this last year, but it's a really uh, well aligned with our health message, message of the wild blueberry uh, based on, you know, the cardi cardiovascular benefits that, you know, regular consumption of wild blueberries has for, for people. So um, we're doing this again, it's going to be one of their major sponsors. And again, we're going to be the, hopefully the wild blueberry harvest festival coming up in this August is actually going to be an in person and not virtual again. So we actually have events that uh, engage people in our community with with the industry. So the last couple of things that we we've done, we was under the building tomorrow fund, uh, but we're going to continue it on with our um, promotion committee is the wild blueberry week. So chef has done this for the last two week two years. Uh, during August, we do half an hour sessions daily. He goes through, uh, does a new recipe, and he has really, really good reach on these uh, episodes. Um, hundreds of people are watching live, and then thousands of people go back and look at these recipes, watch the YouTube videos, and these are people that are actually using the fruit and making that recipe. So it makes a real difference in consumption. And 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 related to that, we're actually linking. Uh, not only where you can buy the frozen product in, in grocery stores, but linking it to the fresh pack operations across across the province. So, you know, we're so we're pointing the the people to the on farm people that are you know producing that fruit, sending it to the farmers markets or buying it farm gate. So I want to talk about our research committee and. For those of you who were at our AGM uh, or attended online would know that we, we approved a uh, research committee budget, budget of almost $200,000 uh, for this coming year. Um, so we're almost committed, we're, we're not quite committed to $200,000 at this point. Um, it, it turns out, um, you know, a lot of researchers are pretty busy. <laughs> so trying to get them, trying to, you know, get these projects going is, is, is challenging. So. But we do have a lot of work that's on on that's happening right now, and I want to highlight a little bit. I'm not going to get into too much detail because we've got a couple of researchers going to talk about uh, that later on this morning. So Dr. Percival is obviously doing that the UAV work, and of course the disease uh, work. He's going to talk a little bit about that. A lot of the funds that we're putting into that project are through the Pan Atlantic project through the CW Birdie, but our association is funding that uh, th through a joint initiative through the three maritime provinces. Dr. Esau is, is, fun, is doing, beginning some work and he's got some posters in there that's highlighting some of that on uh, not only machine learning, but optimizing harvester efficiency. Um, and Dr. White is gonna present later, is talking about uh, certainly a lot of weed control around fescue and other weeds, but also some as, as uh, degree, degree day modeling. Uh, Dr. Chris Cutler is going to be getting back into research in our industry this year. He's got a large uh, project with a PhD, stu PhD student looking specifically at blueberry maggot, uh, looking at modeling work for emergence, but also uh, reduce risk control options, understanding why blueberry maggot ebbs and flows from year to year. And then Perenia uh, with uh, Hugh Liu, Liu is doing some work with monolinear control and looking at some weather models, uh, sort of monolinear timing with those uh, weather models. And of course, we're we're at the last year of the five-year funding cycle for ADA, and uh, Andrew's going to be talking about uh, some of the pollination work and bee health work that uh, ADA's been doing uh, on the path of our industry and the pollination industry. So, and I won't. Uh, Thomas and Hugh are going to talk about this a little later, but I just want to mention that the Weather Station Assistance Program is live right now. So for those that are interested, that, that program through NSDA is, is open, and they're going to go into a lot more detail in, in, in a little bit. So the, the focus of the research of the association, we're, we're still supporting some basic research. So, you know, those, those basic uh, fundamental issues of the industry, we still want to understand. Um, but we're also trying to be proactive and asking researchers to address specific issues that help our far farms be more efficient and profitable. So uh, related to that, so we need we want to have feedback from the growers themselves. So what issues do you guys have out there that you don't feel you have answers to? 
um, you know, we want to have that feedback with you as growers through our research committee, through your board members, and through our office. So if there's questions that you guys have on production issues that you want to have addressed, certainly welcome that feedback. So we've been spending a lot of time on government consultation over the last uh, three or four months, um, talking about various issues. Uh, we, the executive met with Minister Morrow uh, in early February, and we've had subsequent meetings with senior staff uh, since then. Uh, we went to them uh, with several asks on ways to improve some of our business risk management programs. So is there ways we can improve the crop insurance program to, uh, with the understanding that with weather conditions changing and being so volatile, we needed more robust business risk management programs. So looking at ways to improve crop insurance and agri stability is a little bit bigger nut to crack because it's sort of national in scope, but I think there is opportunities for improvement of agri stability going forward. Um, and we're also looking at programs that are gonna help with growth. So, you know, our board sees that there's real potential for growth of our industry over the next 10 years. And if, if we're gonna be increasing our production, we're gonna need more pollinators to do that. So we're looking at things like a longer term pollination expansion program that's gonna sustainably grow that industry so it can supply, um, uh, you know, healthy pollinators to help us grow. And then we also had some initial discussions with Farm Next program, realizing the size of our farms compared to 20 years ago are certainly more expensive. So how do we transition our farms to the next generation? How do we sell them to our neighbor down the road in an economic way? So are there programs within government that can be tweaked to help that, um, to give those that next generation, that new farmer, um, a better chance to be successful? And it, we've been having those discussions with Farm Loan Board and the Farm Loan Board's gonna be having a presentation later on today talking about one of their programs that's um, um, looking at, you know, in, improving uh, farms through land leveling and, 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 so, and so on. So also, I don't know if many are aware, but we're, we're coming up to the new policy framework. So the current policy, federal provincial policy framework that essentially is the umbrella agreement for all the programs that we work under, uh, government programs, that ends next, uh, end of next March, so a year from now. So the new policy framework starts April 1st, 2023. So we're gonna be in consultation over the next several months to try and work, find ways to really enhance uh, supports for agriculture across Nova Scotia, but wild blueberries in particular. And those discussions will go from everything on how do we secure funding for ADA for the next five years? Um, do we have that pollination expansion program for the next five years? How do we have those business risk management programs that um, help us deal with extremes in weather in a, in a proactive way? And then we're also you know, going into these discussions, we're, we're, we're going in it saying that, you know, we really do see uh, the wild blueberry industry as a growth industry. It has real economic impact on our economy in Nova Scotia. And we, we're, we wanna really enhance that. So finding ways to support our farmers, but uh, support the growth of our industry as well. Like I say, we're looking at the five-year pollination expansion program and, and support to ADA. Um, have a lot of industry interactions with other, other supports, uh, other uh, associations. So NSFA is a critical, um, Industry Association Nova Scotia, they represent all the commodities across Nova Scotia. So there's been multiple uh, commodity presidents meetings. We had one oh, about a month and a half ago. And of course the major concern for just about every industry was increasing fuel prices, increasing fertilizer costs. And what's that gonna mean to bottom line? Uh, I was also sitting on a, a committee with NSFA looking at crisis communication so essentially um, developing plans for association. So if an issue comes up, we have a way to deal with it through social media. Uh, there's been lots of examples over the last couple of years where issues come up that face agricultural industries and it explodes on social media and the industries don't 
aren't able to react in real time. So we worked through uh, some crisis communication uh, planning. So it'll give sort of a template for industry to, to deal with those issues if they arise, if ever. Um, they all, NSFA was also applied for a living labs uh, research proposal, and this is related to climate change mitigation. It's a large multi-million dollar project that would uh, extend over five years. So I sat on that committee and if it's successful, we will have a small project related to wild blueberries on uh, finding ways to um, increase carbon sequestration, which just means keep more carbon in our soil and also provide other ecological benefits. So looking at um, hedgerows or tree lines, can they be designed in ways that can, yes, increase carbon sequestration, but also provide uh, protection for winter injury and as a resource for pollinator uh, habitat. So if that's successful, we'll have some in-field uh, trials put out over the next four to five years, and then we'll have field days out there where growers can look at it, see the benefits, um, and maybe adopt them on, on their, their own farm if it makes sense. Um, I've been working a lot with the national body. The used to be Canadian Horticultural Council, but as of three weeks ago, it was uh, officially changed to Fruit and Vegetable Growers of Canada. So we're sitting on uh, virtually on several committees, uh, the Atlantic uh, Caucus, um, the Wild Blueberry Working Group, or the Blueberry Working Group, which includes all the strawberries, cranberries, raspberries, highbush and wild blueberries. And then Gary Brown sits on the Crop Protection Committee for the association as well. And we just had that AGM uh, three weeks ago. Um, we've been working with Wabana Canada as they're working through their new strategic plan. Uh, I'm sitting on the Health Committee, which is a joint committee between um, Wabana US and Wabana Canada. And essentially it focuses uh, research money to do health research around the world. So there's some really interesting research uh, reports that are gonna be published in the next uh, two to three months that are really exciting from a wild blueberry standpoint. They really point towards some exciting things coming that um, I think is gonna make a big difference in demand for our, for our fruit going forward. So um, yeah, it's more to come on that, but really eating blueberries every day has some really clear benefits for health on cardiovascular, on memory, uh, uh, preventing cognitive decline and so on. Um, so it's some exciting things coming there. And there's been several meetings uh, on the Wabana on planning and how they're restructuring that, that association going forward. We've also had several meetings uh, with all four Canadian grower associations, um, the Quebec president and the executive director and the three maritime provinces as well very productive, we're working well together, and I think it's gonna uh, pay some dividends going forward on collaboration on, on multiple levels. So talk about a few other things on things that are coming up on grower out outreach that we're gonna be doing uh, in the next few months. Uh, we've had the eight e-news uh, since our AGM, and we're as we get into the grower season, you're gonna see more and more of those. Uh, Janet and I were just talking yesterday. We're probably going to have to send out two next week because we got so much stuff that's going to be that's relevant for growers um, that we'll be, excuse me, sending out. Uh, make sure you're on our email list. Uh, I think obviously everybody that's online is on our email list because that's how they get connected online. But if you've got neighbors that aren't connected to us, uh, get them to contact the office and get on our email list because um, we're sending a lot of information out there. Um, also, we are going to be planning uh, two twilight or at least two twilight meetings, maybe three slightly different uh, focus coming up, but at the same time, er, late May, early June. Um, focused on specific topics so rather than in the past we do twilight meeting that would be. All different topics, this is going to be you know we're going to go into one site and, for example. I think we talked about this before, but we may be doing a weather station twilight meeting, if that's all right with you guys, <laughs> not to put you on the spot. But um, 
yeah, so we're planning on doing that uh, in late May, early June. And uh, we are planning for a field day in July after almost three years of not having one. Uh, still looking on, on the site. Um, it might be in a new area of the province, actually, so that we haven't been before or haven't been for a very long time. And we're in the planning, and again, we're, our, our, our full intention, intention is to have a full AGM again in, the, in November. Although saying that, I think we're still probably going to have, for most of our in-person meetings, we're going to have a virtual component going forward because I feedback from a lot of the growers. Um, you know, they may not be able to make it on both days, and it's a it's it's a good uh, way for them people to connect um, if they can't make both days. And then just to remind people, we we've got resources for growers fully stocked with fly tri fly traps, wipers, signs, etc. Janice got some out the front desk. So again, if you need to get any of those things, they're they're there. And ultimately, we're here to help growers. So we're here to try and answer questions, point you in the right direction, uh, take concerns and issues to the board. So we're here to advocate on behalf of growers. So um, feel free to call us at any time. That's that's what we're here for. So I, I mentioned uh, just before I end here, I mentioned last uh, last couple of meetings, we're looking to try and get better demographics of our industry and um, to understand who we are as an association, who we are as growers in the province. And we're getting there. So we've got this past year, oops, I'll go back maybe. This past year, we've probably got the most complete list of growers that we've ever gotten. So we have a really, really good understanding of who we are as an industry. And Traditionally, we've been saying we have a thousand growers in Nova Scotia. That's, and we didn't really know, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Uh, we have significantly less than a thousand growers in Nova Scotia. I think probably 10, 15 years ago, um, there were a thousand landowners that owned blueberry ground, uh, but they weren't getting a, a receipt for, they would, it would be somebody was uh, leasing that land and they weren't getting a receipt grow a receipt for that for that land so in fact we have about 638 growers in nova scotia and less we have uh 321 of those produce less than 50,000 pounds in in 2021 so i'm using that so half of our growers produce less than 50,000 pounds a year so less than 25 ton um the the number I, i'm using that number because um, it's an important figure. If you're producing less than 50,000 pounds on an average year, you're going to gross less than $30,000. So if you're grossing less than $30,000 on an average year, you're not, uh, not eligible for current government programs. So I just want to sit. So half of our industry aren't eligible for the current slate of government programs. So it's an important thing for us as an association when we're talking to government, we have to make sure that they realize that. Um, there are a few small programs for smaller growers, but it's uh, you certainly aren't open to the full suite. And we have 317 growers that produce over 50,000 pounds in 2021. So of those growers that produced less than 50,000 pounds, though, they produced 5.9 million pounds in 2021. So half of our growers produced about 13% of our production. The other half, the, the growers that produced over 50,000 pounds, produced 43 million pounds. So they produced about 87% of our total production. So it's just understanding our, our demographics. The, you know, we always kind of did the 80-20 rule on, um, on, from a production standpoint, but this just gives an idea of where the production comes from. So a few other interesting things, and 47% um, of our growers are either based out of or have their fields in Cumberland County. So they may actually live in Halifax, but their fields are in Cumberland County. Now, some of those growers that are based out of Cumberland County, and one large grower, <laughs> has fields beyond uh, Cumberland County as well. So that it's you know, they aren't perfect, it isn't perfect data, but it does give you an indication of where those farms are based. 
84% of production comes from Cumberland, Colchester, Pixo based farms. So if those farms are based in those counties, they account for 84% of the production in Nova Scotia. That's a little higher than in my head, I was estimating 70, 75%, but it's a little higher than I was anticipating. Now, realizing some of that production for some of those farms might be in other counties as well. So again, that one large farm that I was talking about uh, has fields in Hans County, might have some fields in Antigonish County as well. So, but it gives a general idea on where our production is. So the next step that we're gonna be working on uh, over this next year is trying to get a better accurate indication of acreage. So if we understand what acreage we have in the province, we can understand our productivity. So we've, I've been giving productivity numbers over the years on, you know, generally speaking, we're 2,500 pounds per acre on average. Uh, but where, you know, obviously not every field is 2,500 pounds per acre. This past year, we had fields that were in excess of 10,000. So understanding productivity is gonna help us, you know, find ways to in, in, in improve the profitability of farms across the province. And that's really our goal. So there's some unique ways we're going to do that, and we're going to explore ways to minimize, because um, obviously, you know, we don't want to uh, affect the privacy of the individual farms. Um, that's why I'd, I'm not going into more detail on some of the stats that we have here. Um, but it's important for us as an industry to understand what our productivity is in, in a real way and focus our research and our extension in, towards that to improve our overall productivity. So that's a general overview. I uh, touched on a few things of talks that are to come later, but the, I'm sure nobody really wants to talk to, listen to me talk for a whole lot longer and the, the researchers are the ones you're here for. So if there's any questions, um, I can answer them now, but uh, if not, we can move on. No? Okay, thanks everybody. So um, I guess I don't have my, oh yeah, I do. So um, our next uh, speaker is Dr. Scott White and his title might be different from what I put up on the screen, but it, <laughs> uh, fescue management and other weeds, I guess is the general thing. Is yeah, it? it's mostly fescue. Um, so uh, good morning everyone and um, I can't see you, but good morning to everyone online as well. Um, it's just good to be here. So I guess based on Peter's presentation, I'm here to try to help us out of the fescue hangover that we all have, um, which is a rough hangover to get over. I gotta say, it's a tough weed, uh, but I do wanna talk about it because I do think that we're moving in a direction now where um, this grass, you know, pending any unforeseen circumstances, I guess. Um, I think we're moving in a direction where this grass is is going to be a lot easier to deal with than it has been in the past. I, I really think we're, we're finally getting there in terms of not necessarily, I'll never take, never make any assumptions with weeds, but I do think we're getting to the point where uh, we can potentially deal with this grass a little easier, okay? So I, I'm going to mainly focus on fescue today. Um, but these are some of the other weeds that, that I am working with and always looking for plot sites for particularly goldenrod and then and, and cow wheat has been a major issue and a lot of concern from a lot of growers about that over the last few years so uh, we are doing a fair amount of work with that weed now and and always looking for spots for that as well okay but again the main focus here is kind of fescue and and sort of thinking about you know what you can potentially do with this grass this year and some of this will be a little bit repetitive um but i do there's a few key points that i want to make and you know for various reasons last year most many growers were in the position to be able to get a hold to buy some curb and plan to clean up a lot of fields like this but due to supply issues or weather issues or various other things uh, all those good intentions fell through and, and there's a lot of acres of fescue that didn't get the curb that they should have got and so you're kind of coming into the spring not really sure what to do um, my advice is if, if you 
had full intention of applying curb to a piece of ground last fall, then stick to that plan, try to get a hold of the curb if you still can, and just put it out this fall. And, and so what I'm here to try to help address is, you know, what can you do this spring with a fescue field um, to kind of buy you that sprout year until you can get back to this fall um, and, and deal with and get the curb back out uh, to clean up that field, okay? And I guess for today that there's two ways you can look at this. And it all comes down to how much money that you want to spend this spring, knowing that you may be applying curb this fall anyway. So it really is going to come down to, you know, what you want to invest in and how much, uh, how much hell you want to unleash on this grass, I guess. Uh, but the, the main herbicide treatments that I think, you know, most folks should be thinking about this spring, um, if you're going to have to deal with fescue, would be, you know, option is still an important herbicide to think about. I think ignite's important as well. Um, and then you can also potentially consider the use of Jacara, which would be a newer product that it was registered late last fall, so some folks were hoping to apply it last fall, but it, it didn't come through until, I think it was the day of the meeting <laughs> in November, actually. Um, and so it was too late. Uh, but it is available for use this spring. I'm not sure where it sits on processor acceptability list, but it is registered for use and available now. And if you're going to use it, I would advise that you primarily use it for fescue now. Um, and so I think for most growers, um, it's going to be, you know, one or more of these three herbicides that's going to do most of the work for fescue this spring um, to buy you some time to put curb back out this fall. But I will make some comments on Sinbar as well, which is still a product that um, can be considered in the right situation. Okay, so, you know, I've shown these data enough already, um, but it does make a few points that I want to make. And so this is an experiment here where we looked at nothing option or Chikara as a group two treatment and then tank mixed with nothing, Ignite or Roundup. And so we had Ignite and Roundup alone on the fescue, Option and Chikara alone, and then Option and Chikara tank mixed with Ignite or Roundup uh, on the fescue. And, and the rationale for that design it's just simply that all of these herbicides kill weeds by inhibiting amino acid synthesis in the plant once they get in there. And so there's some literature to show that if you tank mix herbicides with those similar modes of action, uh, you can potentially get some synergism sometimes. Not, it's not a guarantee, but, but you might be able to, okay? So these are some data from spring of 2019 when I first started this work. Um, and you can see averaged across Collingwood and Camden where we did the work. Uh, it was a lawn, basically, so like 50 clumps of fescue uh, per square meter in the plots. Um, and then this is in July, so going into the summertime. And you can see, you know, Ignite doesn't kill the grass, but it browns it up. I really have found quite consistently in my experience that that Roundup is very weak on fescue, and I really don't... I know some folks are playing around with it and getting variable results, but... I personally don't think it's a very good fescue treatment and it's a bit risky on the blueberries as well. Um, and it didn't really work that great for me um, in this trial here. Option didn't kill out the grass, but most folks would be aware of that, but it gives good suppression and the tank mixing with Ignite or Roundup didn't give any more killing power. But if you look at the Chikara treatments here, um, you can see they're the ones that pack the most punch in terms of actually killing the living tufts and reducing the actual fescue tuft density and, and killing it off, not just stopping flowering, but actually killing the clumps of grass uh, that were there. Okay. Okay, and this is just what some of the treatments looked like. So this was Chikara and Ignite in, late in the summertime in August. Um, and so outside a curb, that was pretty much the first time I had ever seen anything turn fescue that brown and keep it that brown for a long time outside of a curb treatment. So uh, that's the Chikara and the Ignite there. So it does uh, knock the snot out of that grass pretty good, actually, as a spring treatment. And then going into October, and this is where you can really tell if something's holding or not. Um, going into October, uh, you can see the Chikara and the Ignite treatment is really the one that had the sticking power there uh, because a lot of that grass that was browned up uh, back in the summertime, um, it really didn't green up again going into the fall. It, it did appear that you know a lot of it was actually dead. And that's, 
you know, that's one of the worst things with fescue is in the middle of the summer, it can look brown and dead, and then you come back in October, and all of a sudden it's nice and green again, and it's completely uh, back to what it was like, and it can seemingly do that uh, very quickly. But uh, the Chikara and the Ignite really does seem to uh, kill it and, and kill it dead. Okay, and then this is in the following June, so this would be June of the crop year here. Um, and you can see again the Jacara treatments, but you know, in particular the Jacara and Ignite um, still kept it thinned out uh, going into the crop year as well. Hey, so as a spring sprout year treatment, it really does knock the grass back and keep it knocked back for the whole two years. Um, the, the, the thing you need to think about this spring though, unfortunately, is that it's gonna be your most expensive treatment out of all these treatments. This one here is probably, I don't know if there's Sandra or, or anybody from Cavendish or anything in the room. I don't have the prices in my head, but I think Jacare and Ignite's probably like $110 an acre or something. So um, it's the most pricey treatment on here, but it's the most effective. But this is flower tough density back in July of 2019 in the year that the herbicides were applied. And this is a good indication of reductions in flower tough density. That's a good indication of injury to the fescue and suppression of the fescue. And you can see that all of the herbicide treatments here uh, basically injured and suppressed the fescue for the sprout year and reduced flowering here, okay? And so some of these did that at a much lower price than say the Chikara and the Ignite there. And so, you know, if you're coming back in this fall and you're gonna put down curb anyway, it really comes down to you as the grower making the decision yourself is, is how much do you wanna do to that grass this spring knowing that you might be dropping a nuclear weapon on it this fall in terms of dropping the curb on it. So it, it really comes down to what you want to spend. I personally think a well-timed option application alone would be cheap and would probably buy you a pretty good bud set and yield potential if you're going to come back in with curb. But if you want to try the newer treatment, it's going to cost a little bit more, but it will kill more of the fescue than the traditional treatments. So just some blueberry response here, as usual in the small plots, I'm usually hugging an edge or I'm in a, a real shitty part of the field to stay out of the way. So I very rarely pick up really good yield responses in, in the plot work or whatever, but none of the treatments injured the blueberries here. I know there's some concern about how the blueberries respond to the chikara, uh, but I haven't picked up any major injury and, and pretty good bud set and stuff there. And then this was stem density in this trial. It was affected by the treatments, but the main thing that I saw was uh, reduced stem density from the spring Roundup treatment. Okay, and then it, it's kind of weird because when we had Roundup in tank mixes, if you look at the Jacara plus Roundup, it had the highest stem density. So there's, there's just something funny with Roundup or glyphosate, and I've seen this in the fall and the spring. I've seen highly variable, but sometimes very significant injury from it and no rhyme or reason, uh, to be honest. After pruning in the spring before the blueberries come up, uh, sometimes it just seems to cause uh, a fairly significant amount of injury. And it's probably adhering to organic matter and then getting released when it rains. And it's gonna depend on how much organic matter is there um, in the fields most likely. Okay, but now since folks will be applying this treatment this spring, potentially, I just kind of wanted to show, you know, what I've been seeing in terms of blueberry response to it uh, in, in trials over the years. And so um, I have seen injury to the blueberries from spring chikara applications, so I will acknowledge that, but it's usually been sporadic reddening of the blueberries that they seem to shake off. Uh, very quickly and anytime I've seen any injury that I would say would be of a concern was usually in a block at a site that was a pool of water the week before we applied the treatment quite frankly so in a low spot or something like that and so there's a pretty good chance I can almost guarantee if this when this kind of goes live so to speak and folks are applying it across you know full fields much more acres than it has been 
little pockets of injury are going to show up because this is a new herbicide that the blueberries really haven't been exposed to. And just like when Valpar was started to be used widely, Sinbar and things, you start to see little bits of injury showing up here as more and more clones are exposed to it. So, you know, I do think that that's going to happen. In my experience, it's been confined to parts of a field where the blueberries are stressed by some other external factor. Um, and any injury that I've seen has been transient and doesn't really affect things like bud set or anything like that. As long as you're applying it after pruning or in the spring before the blueberries come up out of the ground. Okay, so. As you start moving into the use of Jacara, treat it just like Spartan. So you wouldn't go out in July and apply Spartan to a blueberry field, or I, <laughs> I hope you wouldn't anyway. Uh, the blueberries won't like it very much and they won't like this very much either. So it's very much apply when the blueberries are dormant. So after pruning in the fall um, or in the spring and potentially fall the sprout year after leaf drop, but I'll talk about that some other day. Hey, this is from 2018, um, and you can see control, altum, option, option plus altum, and 200 grams of Jacara here, and again, uh, getting good, good bud set um, in, in the Jacara treatment there. Not affecting much else, but uh, does seem to boost, boost flower buds there. So, you know, if you've got a fescue problem this spring, and you have curb in the shed that you couldn't apply last year because of the weather, or you were able to get a hold of some more curb over the winter and you're ready to go for this fall, then, you know, I really think your decision orients around these three treatments this spring, and it just comes down to what you want to spend for money. That, that's as simple as that. Um, and the choice is yours. To me, I, I think a spring option treatment followed by curb this fall would be a very good treatment and it would be the least expensive treatment to get you through a sprout year and get the field set up for good yield potential and be able to put curb out again this fall. If you want to maybe hedge your bets and maybe we have a bad fall again and you can't get the curb out again uh then you know a Takara and ignite is going to set that field up a lot better but um you know i i would if you're ready to go this fall with the curb i would stick to that plan and this spring it just comes down to how much you want to invest i i think option followed by this this fall will do the trick but you know, if you want to try the new stuff, you know, maybe pick a field or something and maybe just give it a try so you can get some experience with it as well um, and start seeing how your fields respond to it um, and just get some experience buying it, handling it, mixing it. It's a pretty easy product to use, um, but, you know, might be a good year to get some experience with it before you start applying it uh, all over the place. I got to run to my last class of the year after this meeting, Pete. So I'm going to call out. So, does so anyone have any questions on? This is kind of looking at me, so we can break up my monotony <laughs> by, uh, with some questions. If anybody has any questions on Jacara, I'm, I'm happy to try to answer them right now. No, it'll only be so it can be fall crop year after, before or after pruning, but. Chikara won't be a spring crop year treatment. Is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah, no, it won't be. No, it'll, <laughs> no it'd be too hard on the blueberries. Yeah, and it's not, that's not, registration's not on the label either, but it's just, it's, you'll, you're going to fry your flower buds. Yeah, so there's no, there'll be no help there, so. Question from online. Yep. Uh, what are the pros and cons of curb in the spring versus fall? <laughs> I think there's more cons than pros, um, but if, you know, last couple of years, man, some growers pulled it off and did a good job with it. So, I mean, I, my opinions have changed a little bit. Um, if you can get it out, I would say if you were going to do it this spring, I would hope you already had it out, to be honest, in my opinion, um, or maybe this week, but even next week. I mean, Sunday's sunny and nine. It doesn't take long for that stuff to gas off. So you really got to have the weather in your favor. Um, and so I think if you were going to put it out this spring, I think the window closed or is closing fast. And my real concern with spring curb, and um, this is a little bit off topic, but if you follow trends in herbicide resistance, the worst resistance in the world right now 
is resistance in weeds that are exposed to low rates of herbicides because it selects for genes that allows weeds to metabolize and detoxify herbicides. And once they evolve that, they can detoxify other herbicides that they've never been exposed to before in their life. And it's really hard, perhaps impossible to manage that resistance with herbicides. And if you put curb out in the spring and it starts gassing off, the fescue is going to be exposed to a progressively decreasing rate of curb throughout the spring. And we may select for that type of resistance. And if we select for that type of resistance in fescue, the industry could be effed because Chikara might not work on it. A new herbicide in a vault that they released 10 years from now may not work on it because the weed has genes to break down things like chemicals. And so it's very dangerous type of resistance that you, you're playing with fire with it, quite frankly, and you get burned. The weeds always win with that type of resistance. And so I really, that's my main concern with spring curve is if it starts gassing off, the weeds are getting exposed to reduced rates and it's gonna really hurt us in the long run. Okay. So yeah, I kind of went on a tangent there, <laughs> sorry, but it's a big concern of mine because if we, because fescue is a crippler, right? It's, it's, if you can't kill it out with a herbicide, it's gonna be a real problem for the industry, right? So, but I will acknowledge that if the weather lines up, it does work okay but it's just if you miss the window just save it for this fall would be my advice okay. okay but those are some thoughts there um you'll notice i don't have altum up here but that's because altum's not going to be available this spring uh due to a product change but the new product will be available next year so it's just going to be a small blip on the radar and then it's going to be back next year uh, under a different name and if i don't run out of time I'll, I'll make a quick comment on that here shortly okay 15 minutes okay <laughs> um sinbar i guess i could just ask does anybody even care about we have one question actually um online here uh option shakara and spartan are the same herbicide group yep how much of a caution should that be to herbicide resistance? You don't tank mix them. Um, yeah, so well, Spartan, we're kind of lucky that it doesn't have activity on fescue, so it shouldn't be going out on fescue anyway, but but Chikara does have activity on sheep sorrel. Um, and so uh, we're relying heavily on group twos and we're tank mixing them. You know, I'll admit, based on my own advice, with things like Option and Altum, uh, but we're pushing our luck there. And you'll notice, I have not, never in my life, have I ever shown any data on a tag mix of Chikara with Option or Chikara with Altum, and I never will, because I will never promote the use of that tank mix because you're hitting the weed with multiple comp compounds that are all the same mode of action, which is the easiest way to select for resistance. So um, I don't recommend it. And so if you're using option this spring, I just don't, I don't know what else I can say about it, but yeah, it's a big risk. Yeah. I can save some time. Does anybody care about Simbar? <laughs> Simbar is one of those ones ever since the price went up, you know, the use of it has really kind of tapered off, right? Some folks are using it, some folks aren't. Um, so I, I don't know how many folks even care, uh, but all I was gonna say about it is, it is a good fescue herbicide, but it is highly variable, which makes it very hard for someone like me to recommend because I don't know what the result is that you're gonna get. Okay, so I kind of cheated statistically and went back, back through 12 trials over the years where we had Simbar in them and just compared the Simbar to the control plots. And you can see at these four sites, even though the Simbar bar <laughs> is lower here, um, statistically, it was no better than doing the control. So that was, you know, 150 or whatever it is an acre uh, for nothing, statistically anyway. Um, at some of the other sites, it's worked extremely well, such as on Prince Edward Island. I've, I've, I found Simbar to be very good on fescue over there. Um, but in other spots in Nova Scotia, you know, a bit more variable. And even these ones here where it's worked, it's still arguable if you as a grower would consider that to have actually worked. So dropping from this to this, 
Yes, the statistics program says this is less than this, but when you're walking your field and it's still full of fescue after you've dropped the money on Sinbar, do you care that there's a B there, right? Like you, you won't, I guarantee it. Uh, so that's the conundrum with Sinbar is that if you're this person, you're gonna love it and you're gonna rely on it heavily because it's gonna work extremely well. But if you're this person or even this person, you're gonna say, I don't know what Scott White's talking about, but Sinbar sucks on fescue in my field. Um, and that's the gamble you're always taking, right? So just as an example, this past summer, we did some work, I did some work with Sinbar at a field in DeBert and a field in Collingwood. More out of interest to try Velpar and Sinbar with the Chikara here. So um, a lot of bars here, I know, and you can see the, the, the treatments here, but uh, this was a site basically where Sinbar didn't work. And so you can see here the Sinbar alone, didn't really bring down the fescue density statistically here. And at this site where the Sinbar didn't really help much, the Ignite and Chikara was the better treatment in terms of thinning out that grass um, and keeping it reduced. Okay, and here, this is just from last summer here. So this is the Chikara 200 plus Ignite. This was actually a bare spot in the middle of the field. And in this plot, actually, it was new blueberry growth popping up in amongst the dead fescue. So that was, kind of promising to see and this was at the other site here where you can see where the fescue was in around the blooms there um amen and that's the lower rate at chikara next to the control there so um it, the results were quite good with it this year uh, actually with when it was in with ignite particularly okay and then going into the fall uh you can see it was really the ignite and chikara treatment that held the best um, at this site here, and it would be what I would recommend based on these data here. Um, I think I got too many bar graphs. <laughs> um, in terms of blueberry response here, I didn't see any injury, so there was already pretty good blueberry stem density at that site, so it what didn't go up or didn't go down, and the stems were quite tall anyway, and so the, the blueberry uh, stem density and height was good. Um, but the bud counts, uh, you can see here, um, in the lower treatments here where Simbar was, and particularly where the Ignite and Chikara was, um, that's where we saw the most flower buds or fruit buds on the blueberries. It wasn't great, but there was no fertilizer or anything put on here. This was just the blueberries at face value after we took the, uh, the fescue out. Okay. Question on sulfur, on how it could impact growth of fescue. I don't know, Hugh did it this summer. <laughs> Yeah, so Hugh and I are trying some trials, like just using sulfur like a herbicide and putting it out on some different weeds, but it's only been out for a year and that's too, that's not long enough. I got a bad feeling it's not going to help with fescue because it's adapted to shit, crappy soil. It, it likes bad soils, just like the blueberries do. So I got a bad feeling it, it's not going to be helped, but I'm not sure yet. What was I going to say here? Oh, um, this was a site where Simbar worked. Um, so the same trial at a different site, and you can see the Simbar dropped the density of the fescue. Again, you may not be overly happy as a grower, but statistically, it was reduced by over 50%, to be honest. And if you look at the Simbar with the Chikara here, uh, that was one of the best fescue treatments I've ever seen in my life outside a curb. But that's because Simbar worked at this field. Um, and you don't know that until you apply the herbicide, which is the, the, the problem, right? And so there's the Chikara and Simbar next to the control. Uh, extremely good, fest one of the best fescue treatments I've ever seen. Um, and then in the fall, you can see that it really stayed low in the Simbar and Chikara treatment there. Um, but if you've got a field where Simbar doesn't work, then you're, gonna, you're not going to get that result, right? And, th and that's why it's so hard to recommend it. And you really got to base your use on it based on your own personal experience. So I know some growers that really like Simbar and use it a lot for things like fescue because on their ground, they know that it packs a punch on that grass and they use it all the time because they know it's going to work for them. Uh, but if you know it's not going to, then nothing's probably going to change that. Um, and, and again, that's the gamble with that herbicide. Okay, again, no effects on stem density or height here. Uh, but again, um, the Sinbar treatment here, because it works so well um, with the Chikara, uh, quite a big increase in bud count and the Ignite and Chikara buds were, were looking good there as well. 
Okay, so Sinbar is really up to you. Uh, I will never tell a grower to use it or not to use it. If it's working for you, then go for it. But if it's not, then if you try it for a couple of seasons and you're really not finding it's working, then chances are it's not going to, and you might as well move on to something else. Okay? And kind of working on trying to figure out why that is, but it's, it's a lot of factors come together to affect efficacy of something like Simbar, and it's really hard to tease out all of those factors. Okay. Hey, the other thing to think about this spring is anything like Jacara option or Ignite, they have to hit green to be effective. And so if you mowed last fall and your field's basically buried under almost a foot of grass clippings, then <laughs> that, that's going to be a problem. So um, if you know somebody with a hay rake, you get them to go over the field, it works. I know a grower that does it, does an awesome job, and the field is spotless when he's done, except for the rows of grass that he burns, and that opens up the field and exposes as that grass. But if you're spraying Chikara option or Ignite and it's hitting this dead grass, then that's probably where it's going to stay and it's not going to get on the living fescue underneath. And so this is a real practical problem when it comes to fescue. And that's usually why I say when it's bad enough that it's going to do this after you mow, then you, that's why I, I keep recommending curb on those types of fields because it thins that grass out enough that afterwards you'll be able to mow it and still be able to see green grass because it wasn't like mowing um, an overgrown hay field. How am I doing? Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Any other last questions then on Chikara and fescue? Or anything on fescue? Yeah. Repeat the question too. So people yeah, know. okay. So the question is, uh, if you're concerned about the grass clippings on the fescue, you know, in the fall, or blue, or blue yeah, any debris bearing the fescue, uh, would it be better in the fall to apply it before you mow? And in, I got a trial out on that, and to me, it it looks just as good before you mow than than after. So so yeah, I think. You can let the blueberries lose their leaves and then apply it. Um, I mowed high or mowed right down to the ground. And I personally think a bat wing or a sickle bar first to get the old seed heads out of the way is, is not a bad idea and then spray it. Um, but I'm, I, I found it worked just as well without doing anything. Spray before you mow. I mowed in the spring though. Um, yeah, and it worked, it worked good. Yeah. Because Jacara, if you're putting that out in the fall, especially with Ignite, those are warm weather herbicides. So the more favorable it's getting for curb, the less favorable it's getting for something like Jacara and Ignite. And so it really should be out, you know, by the first couple of weeks in November. Because, um, you know, the fall is not that cold until usually quite late in November. So we got lots of wiggle room, but if it's getting good for curb, it's getting bad for that herbicide uh, generally. Okay, now if you do use it this spring, uh, you will see some offshoot effects on some other weeds. And so this is some old data here. Um, and this is the data where I had first been talking about Spartan here. So you can see option altum control up here. And this is the Spartan effect on the sheep sorrel just over the sprout year here. I did have Chikara in this work all these years ago, but we just never talked about it because it wasn't registered. Uh, but the Chikara here does also knock the sheep sorrel back. And so, you know, if you were putting that out in the spring and you were, you know, mainly for fescue, again, is what I would use it for. Uh, but if you've got some sheep sorrel in the field, it, it, it's going to knock that back as well. Right, so it, it's going to help with that weed as well if it's kind of floating in there around the around the fescue. I will be honest, though, in my experience, as soon as you take out fescue, 
sheep sorrel is Johnny on the spot in that in those fields or in the plots. That's the weed that comes in right after fescue is gone. Sheep sorrel comes in, and it's still gonna probably do that even if you apply chikara because chikara is only gonna damage the sheep sorrel that's there when you make the application and maybe give you a little bit of residual. So um, sheep sorrel is the after you get rid of the fescue in my experience and that it'll still creep back in but the chikara should make it a little less worse would be my would be my feeling there okay. it does work on goldenrod as well um note that i say here this was applied in june do not apply chikara in june uh please don't do that uh but it's very effective on narrow leaf goldenrod um, and so goldenrod comes up early in the spring. And so I'm just showing this because if you've got some goldenrod popping up in a field when you're using this, uh, that early emerging goldenrod's also gonna get damaged by, by Chikara as well. But you'll still need to come back in with Callisto if, if goldenrod's uh, a big concern, but um, it, it will set that back as well. And then this was some work on black bulrush last year, um, and Chikara looks quite good on that. So if you're doing a boom application and there's some clumps of bulrush around in the field, uh, they're probably going to be damaged uh, quite good as well. Okay, I am seeing, I haven't done work with Chikara on cow wheat, but a trend that I have seen in, in all of the plot work I've done with it is we find very little cow wheat in the Chikara plots um, compared to some of the other plots. And so this was a site this was in July or this was in June um, and the Chikara was applied the previous fall, but you can see the, right here where the ignite was, it's full of cow wheat and you can see where the Chikara was, it, the, the cow wheat thinned out. And so from what I'm seeing with it, I, I think if cow wheat's an issue, spring Chikara applications are probably gonna be helping with this wheat as well. And, and this was just, the cow wheat happened to be in these plots. And so I collected some data on it, but you can see here, the chikara, all of the herbicides affected it. So, you know, one thing about cow wheat, as, as common and seemingly problematic as it is, is a very easy plant to kill. It's susceptible to almost every single herbicide, probably except for venture and post uh, that we have. It's just a question of, of keeping ahead of this thing, um, but it's, it's very susceptible to, to most of the herbicides that we're using. Okay. It is- oh, two minutes? Two minutes. Two minutes? Yeah, okay. No, I'm doing good. Um, it's weak on hawkweed though, and this is mainly from my own experience, but also talking with Gavin Graham in New Brunswick. Um, and so don't expect hawkweed to dissipate. It may even get worse when you apply Chikara if you take out fescue or something like that. It was it really not gonna help too much there. Okay. Tons of work ongoing with this product. So you know, lots of fall tank mixtures with it. If you tank mix it in the fall with Chateau, in my experience, it's not a very good tank mix, so don't do it. If you're doing Chateau for moss and you're gonna put Chikara in, still add the Ignite because that makes the Chikara much more effective in the fall. You know, after fall mowing or before, both seem good. Other different rates, I've just got some notes there because I'm running out of time, but but doing lots of trial work to tease out lots of different unanswered questions uh, about that herbicide and how it's going to fit um, in, into blueberries there. And then also looking at it on some other weeds, it looks variable to good on dogbane. Um, so some sites looks great, some sites not so much, so it's kind of variable. It actually looks very promising on spirea. It was a pretty good spot treatment on that. And then, like I mentioned, it looks really good on, on black bulrush as well. Okay. You just yell when I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> okay. This is the new Altim product. It works great. And then we're still doing some clethodim work. And if anybody, I'm looking for clethodim on fescue in Hance County and Antigonish County. This is, I need two more sites there. So uh, that's it, actually.